Welcome to discuss a very important topic in British culture. It's one thing they like to talk about. That's of course the weather. If you have been to Britain, you might have noticed that the British people love to talk about the weather. The British people are said to spend six months of their whole life talking about it. As they use the weather, the conversation starter. So sh why should we study, why should we learn about the weather of the United Kingdom? That's because the weather shapes the way of life of people living there. It influences not only the economy and the politics even of the United Kingdom, but also the way they speak. Have you noticed that there are lots of words, set expressions and idioms connected with the weather? For example, if you are under the weather, that means that you are ill. If you are snowed under, that means that you are busy. And if you are right as rain, it means that you are feeling fine. So, let's start and uh, learn more about the weather. Today's lecture will be devoted not only to the weather, but also its temperature, vegetation and wildlife. So, what's the difference between weather and climate? Weather is not the same as climate. Weather is a day-to-day -day state of the atmosphere and its short-term variation in minutes to weeks. People generally think of weather as a combination of temperature, humidity, cloudliness and wind. We talk about changes in weather in terms of the near future. Climate is the weather of a place averaged over a period of time, often 30 years. Climate information includes the statistical weather information that tells us about the normal weather as well as the range of weather extremes for a location. We talk about climate change in terms of years, centuries, even millions of years. Weather is only something temporary. Weather forecasters try to answer questions like what will the temperature be tomorrow? Will it rain or how much rain will we have? Climate, on the other hand, is more than just a few warm or cool days. Climate describes a typical weather condition in entire region for a long time. The climate of any place results from the interaction of a number of determining factors, the most important of which are latitude, distance from the sea, relief and the direction of the prevailing winds. These factors must be distinguished from the actual features of the climate, such as temperature, precipitation, wind, sunshine, fog, the humidity of the air. Precipitation means rain, snow, sleet or hail that falls to the ground. The position of the British Isles is a basic factor in determining the main characteristics of the climate. Within the limits of the general climatic type, maritime, temperate with no dry season and with summers only moderately warm, there is, however, room for considerable variation between one region and another. The weather of the British Isles is notoriously variable. In every part of the British Isles, obvious changes are taking place as winter passes into spring, spring into summer, and so through autumn to winter. Britain has generally mild and temperate climate, which is dominated by marine. Britain's climate is much milder than that in any other country in the same latitude. This is due partly to the presence of the North Atlantic Drift, which begins as the Gulf Stream in the Gulf of Mexico, crosses the Atlantic Ocean, and so reaches the shores of Europe as a warm current, and partly to the fact that Northwest Europe lies in a predominantly westerly wind belt. This means that not only do marine influences warm the land in winter and cool it in summer, but also that the winds blowing over the Atlantic have a similar effect and at the same time carry large amounts of moisture which is deposited over the land as rain. Britain's climate is generally one of mild winters and cold summers, with rain throughout the year. Also, there are considerable regional changes. Latitudes determine the main characteristics of the climate. 
Temperature is the most important climatic element, depending not only on the angle at which the sun's rays strike the Earth's surface, but also on the duration of daylight. The greater the angle of the sun above the horizon, the greater is the heat received and the length of the period between sunrise and sunset. The length of day at London range from 16 hours 35 minutes on the 21st of June to 7 hours 50 minutes on the 21st of December. The sea greatly modifies the climate of the British Isles, for the relatively small area and the indented nature of the coastline allow maritime influences to penetrate well inland. The sea whose waters have a higher specific heat than the rocks of the land surface warms up more slowly but also cools down more slowly than does the land. Consequently, in summer the land tends to be warmer than the sea, in winter the converse is true. This moderating effect of the sea is in fact the cause of the relatively small seasonal contrast experience in Britain. The prevailing winds in the British Isles are westerly. They are extremely moist as a result of their long passage over the warm waters of the North Atlantic. On the arrival of Britain, the winds are forced upwards, and as a result, large-scale conversation occurs, clouds form and precipitation follows, especially over the mountainous areas. Because of the North Atlantic drift and the predominantly maritime air mass that affect the British Isles, the range in temperature throughout the year is never very great. The annual mean temperature in England and Wales is about 10 degrees centigrade or Celsius. In Scotland and Northern Ireland, it's about 9 degrees Celsius. The mean January temperature for London is 4 degrees, and the mean July temperature is 17 degrees. July and August are the warmest months of the year on average, and January and February are the coldest. The mean summer temperatures throughout Britain increase from north to south. The mean monthly temperature in the extreme north ranges from 3 degrees during the winter to 12 degrees during the summer. The corresponding figures for the extreme south are 5 degrees and 16 degrees. The distribution of sunshine shows a general decrease from south to north. A decrease from the coast inland and a decrease with latitude. During the months of longest daylight, May, June and July, the mean daily duration of sunshine varies from 5 hours in northern Scotland to 8 hours on the Isle of Wight. During November, December and January, the months of shortest daylight, sunshine is at minimum, with an average of half an hour a day in some parts of the Scottish Highlands and two hours a day on the south coast of England. Generally, the coasts are everywhere sunnier than neighboring inland districts. Ireland is a subject of frequent clouds and records little sunshine. Spring is normally Britain's driest season, even though April is by tradition showery. Cold weather usually lasts no later than mid-April and there are frequently some very warm days during the second half of the month. By late spring daytime temperature rises considerably and the thermometer may even reach 21-24 degrees Celsius over a wide area. June is the brightest month of the year for Britain in general. Rainfall tends to increase during July and August, partly because Atlantic depressions some nearer to the coast during these months and partly also because air, as it becomes warm, is capable of holding more moisture. Late summer is often noted for very warm weather, and this will continue into September. North and northwest winds often bring heavy falls of snow to North Britain during late October and November, but they are usually short-lived. Continental air sometimes reaches the British Isles in summer as a warm, dry air stream, but it is more frequently experienced in winter when it crosses the North Sea and brings bitter weather to eastern and inland districts of Great Britain. In fine, still weather there is occasionally haze in summer and mist and fog in winter, but the British people say they have all four seasons in one day, and that is true.
With its mild climate and varied soils, the United Kingdom has a diverse pattern of natural vegetation and wildlife. Over 70,000 species of animals, plants, fungi and single-celled organisms can be found in the United Kingdom. The present vegetation of Great Britain owes much of its character to the influence of man. Only in the more remote parts of Ireland and the Scottish Highlands do remnants of the natural vegetation still exist. The natural vegetation, in the true sense of the term, has practically disappeared from Britain, and most of the present cover is loosely known as semi-natural in the unfenced rough grazing and in the woodland. With its mild climate and wide variety of relief in soils, Britain once had a diverse pattern of vegetation. The original natural vegetation consisted of forest, fen and marsh in the wet lowlands, especially where the drainage was poor and shrub, and more lands on the uplands where soils were thin. In the lowlands areas, the oak forests must have been the natural vegetation. The United Kingdom was originally a land of vast forests with great stretches of marshland and smaller areas of moors. In the course of time, much forest land was cleared and almost all the lowlands outside the industrial areas were put under cultivation. Over the centuries, however, the forests have had to make way for agriculture and settlement. But a systematic and barbaric deforestation took place in the 16th, 18th centuries with the construction of factories and roads, the development of mineral resources, the production of charcoal for iron smelting, as well as to provide timber for shipbuilding and constructional purpose generally. By the beginning of the 20th century, Britain's timber reserves had been so seriously depleted that in 1919 the government set up a permanent forestry commission charged with the task of improving the position. It carries out a program of planting in places which are not now forested and of improving existing woodland, mainly on the acquired land in Scotland, Wales and the English Lake District and East Anglia. Today, forests and woodland occupy only about 9% of the surface of the country. Of the total 43% in England and 43% in Scotland, and about 2% in Wales and the remainder in Northern Ireland, 56% of forests of woodland belong to private landowners. Over 90% of the timber used in the United Kingdom is imported. Today, only a few scattered areas of extensive woodland remain, such as the New Forest in Hampshire and Sherwood Forest in Nottinghamshire, which owe their survival largely to the fact that in the Middle Ages they were set aside royal forests for hunting. Throughout most of England and parts of Wales, where temperatures are high enough to permit trees to complete their annual cycle of growth between spring and autumn, trees such as oak, birch, beech and ash are more numerous. The greatest density of woodland occurs in the north and the east of Scotland. In the north end of the higher ground in the west, coniferous species of trees can be found, such as pine and fir, in some places also birch. Most of Britain is agricultural land of which about one third is arable, and the rest pasture and meadow. Areas of permanent grassland are widespread in practically all parts of Britain except East Anglia, where arable farming is predominant and in the highest parts of Scotland and Wales. These pastures form the chief grazing lands on which cattle and sheep are reared and fattened. In certain areas of the country, particularly parts of the highlands of Scotland, relief and climatic conditions are not conducive to arable farming, and such areas are therefore characterized by extensive moorland. The hilly moorlands provide several types of wild vegetation, such as heather, fern, other hill grass, and these are to be found in the highlands of Scotland, the Pennines, the Lake District, the mountains of Wales, and elsewhere with the surface of thin, poor soils. The fauna or animal life of the United Kingdom is much like that of northwestern Europe, to which it was once joined. 
Many large mammals such as bear, wolf have been hunted to extinction. Others are now protected by law. About 50 land mammals are still found in the United Kingdom. There are many foxes there. Potters are common along rivers and streams, and seals live along much of coast. Hedgehogs, hares, rabbits, rats and mice are numerous there. Deer live in some of the forests in the highlands of Scotland and England. There are several small lizards, two or three kinds of snakes, and several kinds of frogs and toads. Roughly 230 species of birds reside in the United Kingdom, and another 200 are migratory. Most numerous are the blackbird, sparrow, and starling. The number of large birds is declining, however, except for game birds, pheasant, partridge, and red crows, which are also protected. Game birds are birds that are hunted for food and sport. The humid climate of Great Britain is good for plants and flowers. Some of them have become symbols in the United Kingdom. Probably you know that the poppy is a symbol of peace, the red rose is a national emblem of England, the thistle is a national emblem of Scotland, and daffodil and the leek are as emblems of Wales. The shamrock is the emblem of Ireland. Robin Redbreast is a national bird of the United Kingdom. The government of Great Britain takes up actions to return species and habitats to the British countryside that have been absent for decades and sometimes much longer. In the process, it helps to recharge the natural world with wonder and help people to reconnect with it. A lot of comprehension questions should be looked through and answered in written form. After that, you are offered a video where you can check your knowledge on UK wildlife. To test your knowledge of the UK. So grab your pen and paper and let's go. Question one. Basking sharks are the UK's largest fish and second largest in the world. They are about the same length and weight as A, a cow, B, a double-decker bus, or C, an African elephant. The answer is B, a double-decker bus. Question two. Mallards can be spotted in many UK parks. Males and females look so different, they might be mistaken for different species. Is this a male or a female? That was a male mallard. Question three. In UK skies, you might see starlings performing a mass aerial stunt of diving and swooping. Do you know what this formation is called? Is it A, a fancy flock, B, a murmuration, or C, an aerial pod? The answer is B. This amazing formation is called a murmuration. Question four. The UK is home to several species of owl. If you're lucky, you might hear the barn owl at night. Do you know what the noise they make is called? Is it A, a screech, B, a honk, or C, a hoot? It's A. Many owls are known for their hooting noises, but barn owls, in fact, screech. Question 5. This species of dolphin is commonly found in UK waters. Can you name it? Is it A. Bottlenose dolphin, B. Short-beaked common dolphin, or C. A spinner dolphin? That was a bottlenose dolphin. Question six. Listen closely. Can you guess which UK marine animal makes this sound? Is it A, a white-beaked dolphin, B, a spider crab, or C, a gray seal?
That was the sound of a white-beaked dolphin. Question seven. A puffin can beat its wings up to 400 times a minute, making them speedy in the air. Can you guess the speeds they can reach in miles per hour? Is it A, 30 miles per hour, B, 90 miles per hour, or C, 50 miles per hour? The answer is C, 50 miles per hour. Question eight. Puffins have been said to look like clowns. Can you guess why they've been given this nickname? Is it because of A, their bright beaks, B, their big feet, or C, because they can look funny when they carry a lot of fish? It's A. During breeding season, they wear a colorful beak, and after the summer, it then returns to a dull and dark color. Question nine. Honeybees have a clever dance move to tell their nestmates where to go to find the best source of food. From the video, can you guess what this special dance is called? Is it A, the bee buggy, B, the waggle dance, or C, the buzzle? That amazing dance is called the waggle dance. Question 10. Seals can often be spotted in UK coastlines. Do you know what baby seals are called? Is it A, cubs, B, foals, or C, pups? C, baby seals are known as pups. Question 11. Blackbirds are commonly found in the UK, but how can you tell the difference between a male and a female? Because of A, females have shorter beaks, B, female blackbirds have brown feathers, or C, females have a higher pitched bird song. The answer is B, female blackbirds have brown feathers. Question 12. Hedgehogs can be found in many UK gardens. When attacked, these shy creatures A. Roll into a tight ball so only their spines are exposed B. Spit out poisonous saliva at their attacker or C. Let out a scream A. They roll into a tight ball so only their spines are exposed Question 13. The common frog is widespread in mainland Britain. What do males do to attract a female mate? Do they A, flash from brown to green, B, croak, or C, up high in the sky? B, they attract a mate by croaking. Question 14. If honeybees need to appoint a new queen bee, they select a young larvae and feed it a special food called A. Royal jelly B. Queen's pollen or C. Royal honey The answer is A. Royal jelly Question 15. Can you name this rodent often spotted near UK rivers and lakes? Is it A, a water vole, B, a brown rat, or C, a bank vole? That was a water vole. Question 16. Otters can be found all around the UK in lakes, rivers and oceans. They are amazing swimmers, but what attribute enables them to swim so well? Is it A. Short tails, B. Long toenails, or C. Webbed feet? C. 
See, they're webbed feet. Question 17. Blue tits are one of the most recognizable birds found in the UK. Can you name their favorite snack? Is it A, red currants, B, caterpillars, or C, daisies? The answer is B. Blue tits love to munch on caterpillars. Question 18. Otters learn their incredible swimming skills from their mothers. But how old are they when they learn to swim? Is it A. Around two weeks old, B. Around two months old, or C. Around two years old? The answer is B. Otters learn to swim at two months old. Question 19. Can you name this breed of butterfly often found in UK gardens and parks? Is it A. A small copper, B. Small tortoise shell, or C. Painted lady? That beautiful butterfly was a painted lady. And finally, question 20. Did you know seahorses can be found in UK waters? Well, which body part do they use to cling onto seagrass and seaweed? Is it A, their snout, B, their tail, or C, their neck? The answer is B. Seahorses cling on to seaweed with their tails. Thank you for your interest in country studies and please stay tuned to our YouTube channel.